We have Emily L. Ferguson, who is a landscape photographer located in North Falmouth on Cape Cod. She began her career in midlife and is largely self-taught, inspired by some of the leading mid-century figures like Elliot Porter and Galen Rowell. During her 25 years of photographing around the Cape and southeastern Massachusetts, Emily has built a daily portfolio de detailing the margin between land and water around the perimeter of Buzzards Bay over a 12 month period and also documents recurring community celebrations and the recording of traditional wooden boat construction and sailing. Emily is affiliated with galleries in her area and has been published in national and local magazines. At present, she's involved with a local herring recovery project and the upcoming 100th anniversary of the Beetle Cat, a 12-foot gaff-rigged sailboat, which she has been photographing since 1996. So Emily, if you are ready, please unmute yourself and we'd love to see your work. Okay, about um, 19, in, in my childhood, um, my parents owned a house on Buzzards Bay. And um, so my affiliation with the Cape goes back to the 1940s. Um, but I finally was able to move here in 1980 to live year round. Um, and uh, I spent quite a few of the first um, 15 years when I was living on the Cape, not being uh, particularly involved with taking photographs for any specific sort of project, uh, but just generally taking photographs when I happened to be inspired. Um, but at a certain point, I began to become much more serious about that. And um, one day on one of those weeks, a friend of mine showed up and dragged me all the way down to Truro to this beach, which um, was an Atlantic Ocean beach um, under, uh, under stress. Um, the first time we went there, we went past the house, which this um, nice railing is on the front porch of, and the house was submerged in sand all the way up to the second floor because it had been buried in the winter by the dune. But I wasn't thinking very clearly and it was somebody else's property and I was a little shy. And so I only have mental images of the sand in the second floor bedrooms. You could walk up the beach access path and see, look in the windows and see the second floor full of the dune sand blown up by the ocean in the winter. In any event, uh, just as a little background for people who don't know their way around the Cape, um, this is basically the town of Truro, the town to the north of here is Provincetown, the town to the south is Wellfleet, the Cape is an arm sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean. And all along this coast of it is high dunes and some low dunes with um, uh, broken up by wetlands. Uh, the wind blows violently sometimes from the Northeast, but primarily it blows up in this direction. Um, this land is subject to these very violent storms. The blizzard of 78 was one of the first ones that really clobbered it. And it's been clobbered subsequently many times because of uh, climate change and the frequency of the change in the temperature of ocean water. The area which attracted my attention is the area occupied by the Pamet River, which starts over here behind the Atlantic Ocean and the dune and goes towards the west side and empties into Cape Cod Bay. Um, 
you'll see what happens to the dune as we progress here. The area looks, looked like this when the uh, Europeans arrived, more or less, give or take a definition or two. The native people used the wood from the trees for fire and for cooking, but when the uh, Europeans arrived, it, the, the ravaging of this whole ecosystem really began at that point. Uh, further inland, the, it still looks like this and looked like this back in 1620. Um, the freshwater marsh looks like this now and full of blueberry and huckleberry. And it mostly looked like that when the white man arrived. Um, the river was an impediment to people to getting, getting by vehicles down to Provincetown. So one of the first things the white men did was build a bridge. And um, that was okay, except that when the um, tide was high, sometimes the water would come in. So eventually they built something more solid. And because the river had to get out, they put a valve in it. And one of the effects of doing that was they created a fresh a saltwater marsh on the Cape Cod Bay side, but they blocked the river from getting out by that valve on the ocean side. Um, in, in 1873, there was actually train service all the way to Provincetown. And so they chose the flat side of the Cape and built the train tracks all the way from Hyannis all the way to Provincetown. And originally they had completely diked over the river here also, but this is what remains of the railroad route at this point. On the ocean side, um, entrepreneurs thought it would be a great healthful summer refuge for city people. They would come on the train and they would move into their own little cottages and there would be a rec hall and they would play pool and they even built golf course and um, in this low spot on Boston Beach was a good place to do that because there was no high dune that someone would have to climb down to get to the ocean. However, <laughs> come the blizzard of 78 and before that, the um, seashore, which had demolished most of that kind of uh, recreational private cottage colony. Um, the blizzard of 78 caused the water to invade. And that was the, the first really serious invasion of the head of the Pamet River. But those storms have increased with considerable frequency. They're now happening every two years and salt water is invading much more often. Um, the town is perturbed about that because this was a big tourist location and the National Seashore was concerned about what they should be doing about it, both ethically and uh, from a financial point of view. And so uh, a lot of organizations centered around environmental issues on the Cape um, got hauled in to do a whole lot of different kinds of tests and studies and try to determine the impact that this was going to have on the river. Um, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems turned out to be this valve called a clapper valve. The valve functioned by closing when the tide came in from Cape Cod Bay it came in here and eventually it exerted enough pressure on the valve to close it at high tide. When that happened, of course, any water that was upriver of the valve couldn't exit. So when there were big storms and two or three feet of salt water arrived from the ocean in the head of the river, it couldn't get out. And sometimes it took 
a couple of weeks to drain out because it could only get out when the tide was down low enough for the valve to open. This is a, a nice side view that sh shows you how the, um, how the valve functions. This is a modern valve. Um, it was pushed out by the um, 2013 storm and left a hole. Unfortunately, it's only four feet wide and all that water that was dumped up river couldn't move very fast through such a small space. Um, after the, the perfect storm of 91 and the next one of 92, it was possible to canoe the whole upper half of the river. Um, but eventually all the stuff that grows there, all the bushes and shrubs over, over took it and it became more closed. There's a lot of poison ivy in there also, so it's not a lot of fun to go in there with a canoe and have to dodge all that. Um, one of the homes that had been not part of the recreation of the cottage colony was still privately owned. In fact, there are three or four homes in there which the seashore permitted to remain in private hands. And um, this is the home which had been buried in sand every year by the storms. And eventually they, the people who owned it jacked it up. And eventually the, uh, all the, sh the freshwater marsh plants um, filled in enough that it was no longer possible to paddle uh, up to the back of the ocean. It's kind of interesting to go down there every once in a while. The ocean comes in and scours the beach and you find remnants of the foundations of the, um, of the cottage colony and also remnants of a road which went there, which hasn't been there for a long time. Um, so the town and the seashore got together every time there was a big storm, tried to decide how to protect the the beach, how to protect the dunes. Um, and these are some photographs from 2010 when they were attempting to remediate the, uh, the sand removal that the ocean was pulling off. Um, and the people who owned the house thought, okay, we'll continue to take care of the house, but it's kind of a gift and we don't know how long this will go on. Um, and some of that was kind of, kind of working. Um, an engineering firm had an interesting idea of how to, how to reinforce the beach and allow the dune to rebuild itself. Um, but unfortunately, the ocean, of course, had other ideas about what it could be doing here. And um, this is the effect that it um, brought on the beach. Uh, in, in this case, in 2013, it just opened up a slot and pushed about four acres of sand from the dune into the head of the Panic River. Here you can see, it's very interesting standing out there in 40 mile an hour winds with a 45 millimeter DSLR trying to hold it steady. And uh, a tripod really doesn't work in that situation because it's so messy. Um, so the dune got eaten away and the two houses lost 10 feet of uh, dune frontage uh, in that storm. And um, the two owners of those two houses tried to build us to protect their real estate. Um, and the town decided to try one more time and it went off to another one of its beaches and hauled tons and tons and tons and tons of sand in there and plopped it down in the gap and tried to allow the dune to rebuild. And there were wonderful things 
wonderful little vignettes that one can get, including one's trash, which the ocean brought in and dumped around the periphery of the Edaba River. But I didn't show them here. The other problem, of course, for the town was that the beach was a big money maker in the summer. And so um, they were very anxious about how they were going to maintain uh, parking so they could collect parking fees, how they were going to make it so that people could use the, use, continue to use the beach. But in 2015, the ocean did it again. And this time, finally, the town decided to stop with support from the seashore after uh, some wonderful public meetings in which a great deal of scientific information was revealed to all the townspeople who showed up. Um, there was a lot of concern for the people who lived around the river that their fresh water wells would be invaded by salt water. Um, and there are some very interesting studies about the uh, freshwater lenses on either side of the valley of the river, um, which you can find online. Um, and this was because that 2015 storm was in uh, January. Uh, here are some photographs of um, the kind of destruction that the storm brought on the properties on either side. And the, basically the hole that the storm created in between the dune. And at this point, it, it, there was not any dune anymore. It, it was basically now all beach. And in 2018, we had another one. And this one was much milder uh, in its impact because it didn't happen at a full high tide and because there was less resistance from the dune because the dune had been eliminated by the previous storms. This one I shot on the phone because it's so much easier to control. The previous video I had shot uh, with my cannons and they, they're much, it, the big bulky lenses and the wind really clobbering you. It's just a totally different process. Um, and this storm took out the house um, and left it hanging over the edge. Um, but not the other house, which had been moved back, uh, which will get taken out in the next uh, three years. Um, so I went down there because by then I'd become acquainted with the people who owned the house. I went down there and took a couple of nice photographs of the house on the night before they tore it down. Um, after they tore it down, the place didn't really, we really had to know the house was there in order to see that it had been. Um, the town came in and decided that it was going to try to give all that sand an opportunity to recover. Um, and so it wanted to keep people out of the whole overwash area in the, behind the, what had been the dune. And so they started much more rigorously controlling access to that area. And this was kind of neat because you could see the footprint of the house um, exposed to the wind in a way that the house had protected it from. Um, the, it was going to, it's really hard to keep people off that empty space because it's so, it looks as though if you walk in there, you're not going to get in, in, in environmental trouble. But the owners of that little tiny remaining piece of dune planted plugs of um, beach grass and um, tried to protect the front edge of their property with um, fencing. Unfortunately, every year the fencing gets ripped up by yet more storms. And so 
in honor of the house, I did a couple of little superimpositions, which represented the memory of the house and the um, people who, these were not the actual people who owned the house, but their physical bodies are the same as the two people who owned the house. And it was just convenient that they happened to be there that day. Um, here's another one with a superimposition of the, 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 the race of the house and the destruction of it. Um, so now, the only thing left to do really basically with that whole end of the, of the river is to um, record more or less the continuing destruction of, of subsequent properties and, and the rebuilding, if it's permitted to happen, of the ecosystem at the head of the river. Um, but the town has decided to get rid of the clapper valve and to try to make it much less stressful for the river to fill up with so much salt water in such huge doses in, you know, four feet of salt water resting in the whole river valley is not working very well. So they've decided to remove the clapper valve and as part of that whole process, they are going to install um, huge um, concrete um, what's the word I want? Uh, tunnels underneath the road so that the water can get out. This is complicated by the fact that the state also owns Route 6 and the road the town can control is basically Route 6A. And so that all they can do is remove the valve and completely rebuild the, the road with either a bridge or a pair of culverts but the state has, still has a four foot culvert that goes under the entire exit ramp and highway going to Provincetown there. So the water will be compressed to that four foot um, culvert, and then it will get just to the other side and discover it has all this space to empty out um, so the state also has to be dragged into remediation of the whole area. I'm looking forward to going down here and watching, um, sorry about that, watching the um, restoration of this, this shoreline over here um, and watching the, maybe even the installation of the culverts and the way in which the town handles that whole thing and the pressure that it puts on the state to also do its part. Um, the town's very upfront about online, about its positions, about things. And you can just go to the town and start reading, you know, reports of public meetings and selectmen's meetings. So they talk about how to, to, um, to deal with these kinds of things. Uh, on the other side, of course, this all this stuff in here will eventually get nibbled away by future storms and and eventually this house will have to go the houses further up the dune here have already been moved back two or three times and um get back to the beginning these two houses here um which are not quite as clear in that photograph as they are in maybe some others. Oh, there, those two houses. They have both already been moved back a number of times. And eventually, um, if sea level rise doesn't come in and uh, turn the whole thing into an island, um, then this dune will also I mean, the whole ecosystem is going to come apart with sea level rise. Um, the projected sea level rise is like six feet by the end of this century, and the Cape will just be basically a, a wetland marsh with a few little islands sticking up as a result of that. Um, and of course, there are unfortunately. Uh, things which can make that happen a lot faster and make it 
uh, far more catastrophic, uh, having to do with the Antarctic sea shelves, ice shelves melting. I, I mean, the story is really not pretty, no matter what you read in the paper. Um, so this is a project which I've been following for 25 years, but very intermittently and not always with a whole lot of wisdom. Uh, but I've certainly had a very interesting time and it continues to hold my attention. And it's, it's basically fits in with my involvement with constant involvement with that interface between the shore and the ocean and the impact of the ocean on the shore all around the place I live in. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear about them. Emily, thank you. Your knowledge of the Cape and the history and the landscape is remarkable. Um, did you begin photographing and then delve into the history and the environmental aspects or did you get involved from the historical perspective and the environmental perspective and then begin photo documenting? No, I started because um, I, because I was interested in um, what the cave looked like. And I mean, I started out just taking pictures. The whole thing was, um, it was, uh, it was a beautiful place and I loved it. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to express that about the place. And as I explored, not just the end of the Cape that I live on, the upper Cape, but the whole area um, north of Orleans, um, East Ham, Wellfleet, Truro, and Provincetown, um, I became aware of the different ecosystems. The Cape is, to a certain extent, three different ecosystems. And the, uh, the dune ecosystem of the, the outer Cape is a separate entity entirely. And the, the section of the Cape I live on doesn't look anything at all like the section down there. And um, I just got more and more involved with, with uh, recording and, re and reporting on what I saw. And eventually I became very interested in the why and the how of what I was seeing. And so, of course, because Pui and MBL are in Woods Hole and because the people in P-Town are constantly uh, involved with whales and with their ecosystem, there's a huge, just a huge amount of research everywhere online. Um, the seashore is doing it and private organizations. Um, and, and so it's really easy to get informed. Yeah, I mean, your images- <laughs> a little time. Your images accompanying the narrative is just makes it so much more impactful, actually seeing the land disappear and the houses disappear. And actually, I have a question that maybe is a little political, so I don't know if you feel comfortable answering it, but I'm wondering, given everything that you've seen personally and everything that you've researched, you know, I always hear about um, should people even build? near the ocean? You know, should people still even be there? I mean, you're talking about these houses being moved back. I can't even imagine the ordeal and expense of moving a house um, because it was too close to the water. So I'm just wondering um, well, if you have an opinion of, about that. Of course, we've moved lighthouses. Um, I have a whole set of photographs of the moving of Highland Light, uh, which explore the engineering involved in jacking up uh, however many tons of brick. Uh, and, and no, people should not be building there. But, you know, real estate has value and towns are dependent on real estate taxes to run their schools and their public services. And it's the way Massachusetts is set up. And to make changes in that is 
of course, going to involve awareness by a heck of a lot more people than just those of us who live up against where, where we can see it happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there's really, uh, I don't have any hope that any of it is going to happen in time. Um, I'm, I'm kind of appalled that people are still having children uh, because the world that they're going to live in is, is grim. Um, and, and getting people to understand that. But, and I'm pretty forthright about that with the people in my circle. They pretty much understand that um, we need to stop. It was Bill McKibben about two weeks ago who said something I saw in the New Yorker. He said, if, if, if we have to stop burning today, and what he, mean, what he meant, of course, is we have to stop burning wood and we have to stop burning oil and we have to stop using oil to manufacture products and we have to stop, I mean, this whole preoccupation with trash. Um, my car right now from a little trip I made today has five returnable cans and three returnable bottles and I pulled them out of the roadside. It has plastic bags. I mean, like, like Mary, sometimes I take pictures of it. And when I do, however, I pick it up and I put it in the car and I get it out of the ecosystem because we got to stop doing this. And <laughs> I don't know how to put it across, especially to the scientists who are having children, um, but it's a very complicated question. We need immigration because we need people to work rather than rich white people just having more kids and using up. I mean, it's just a very complicated thing to talk about politically because so many people don't want to hear about it. Um, a, a question has come in. Uh, is it projected that Provincetown might become an island? Well, Along the National Seashore side of P-Town, there, there are high dunes. This is a wetland up here. And um, this is, Provincetown goes like this, and curls around in there. Um, and this is dune here, and all along here is dune. And the seashore is in here, but then about here it starts with a lot of low land, of saltwater marsh. And as you get around the point, it's flat and it's sand. And there are two lighthouses on it. Um, and you really can't drive out there unless you have the right kind of vehicle and, and permits. But um, the same thing is happening in here where human beings dammed up this egress point for Pilgrim Lake. And it became fresh water. And one of the things, because this point where that happened was in Truro, uh, Truro has opened that up so that salt water can get in there. Um, and now they're in the process of opening this one up so salt water can get in there. But this high section of, of the dune, when the wind hits it from the northeast this way, it pushes the sand down to the south. And so Chatham is building up a long spit of land at the elbow of the Cape because all this sand from the dune is blowing south. But when it hits it from here, it pushes it this way and it goes around the corner and starts to fill in the wetland marsh, marshes which are in here. So I don't think there's much hope for a whole lot of this over the next 75 years. And eventually this will, um, with six feet of sea level rise, you can see what's going to happen, that um, if this sand holds, then it'll just be little islands because the roads are not all in high places. And the same thing is happening in, in Wellfleet, where there's a huge amount of land at, um, you know, five feet above sea level. And it, uh, you know, 
the, the prospect's not very good. <laughs> I had to be discouraging, but it's not. I, I have to say, you know, not living there, um, experiencing this destruction um, through your photographs has, you know, is it makes it um, just much more real. And I think that um, can be said about Mary and Christine's work as well. Of course, when you see a photograph, a photograph speaks a thousand words. And, you know, when you're thinking about the environment and you're thinking about changes you can make and observations of what's all around you, I think um, all of you have really um, brought so much more of these issues to our attention with your work. And I just want to thank you again.